disappointed in the news of his program wreck. He reports he's been experiencing overwhelming feelings of self-doubt, feels he's not capable of performing his duties, and indicates that on a regular basis he considers dropping out of residency. On a few occasions, he's shown up late to morning rounds, and he's told his senior resident that he just couldn't motivate to get out of bed and over to the hospital. And he now seeks out his program director for advice regarding how to manage his difficulties and openly discusses whether he should seek a therapist. So I'm just curious, has anyone experienced a similar scenario or heard of similar scenarios? Want to give a snippet just so so people know that this is not just coming out of out of the ether that this happens without without revealing any any detail. that might get to a point and they may, you know, they may just not have the, the competency, the clinical competency, but that's probably a small number, a very small number of residents. And you know, when, you, when you're dealing with residents like this, it's really about providing them the support that they need um, to get through difficult times and, and they shouldn't be feeling like they need to drop out. Um, so, so, so yeah, so this, yeah. The other side of that though is that sometimes they have a realization that they're in the wrong place in the wrong place and they want to take off a little bit of time and get some fresh air and some fresh air and clean their heads and stuff like that. So it's not just that they're not doing it right. It's that they're not doing it right because they don't have the tools to do it right. They just don't have the time to do it right. They just don't have the work to do it right. right. And that's a healthy thing. That's a healthy thing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, sometimes, uh, yeah, I think there's lots of people that just uh, have, have chosen a field that maybe they didn't realize wasn't the best fit for them and it's just taken them time to get there. Um, and so, you know, that's that's why you need to have this conversation when the when the resident comes in. Um, but there's there's sort of a lot going on here, right? There's the there's not only the concern about dropping out, but this resident's also saying, you know, should I should I get help? Should I seek a therapist? Yeah. writing this up, I was sort of toying about whether I should leave that last part in or out, because I think, you know, even if you left it out, you as the, as the program director might really feel like this resident should be referred for therapy, um, that they might actually be depressed and, and would benefit from therapy, and that that may be all they need to get over a hump and, and, and sort of get past those feelings of, of wanting to drop out. So, so yeah, um, I mean, I think you're right. I think it, it, uh, this, do, this is an example of pretty insightful resident who, who asks for whether they should get therapy. Yeah. Um, and I'm just thinking about, like, yesterday, um, this resident was talking about how she
get at this point and then measure the dealing with it when they when they get there. Okay. Plus the big thing is I should have known that there was three things to deal with in that one. Yeah. Which is why I didn't even bother to ask you about that. Cool. Um but moving on from there, um so I have my card and I have my my um dice roll and I'm ready to roll. So I do a quick dice roll now and I look at my card and I look at my dice roll and I go, Yep, yeah, that's all good. it all the more harder because I, I would argue that the, the culture of training really tells residents that you know they shouldn't sh really show signs of weakness and so uh, it makes it all the more harder for those of us that are in, in you know in education as educators to, to pick up on it so uh, that's what my point earlier was if you see if you see someone who you know who may be in the corner and they seem to have they maybe have tears in their eyes after a bad day uh, it may not just be that bad day, maybe it is, but um, that may be the only sign you have that they're really in distress, and so you got to pick up on it. So um, basically, we've kind of addressed these questions. Um, you know, what, what I just want to bring up is that um, in terms of the reactive component, uh, it's a good idea that, to know what to do when someone like this enters your office, uh, to have a protocol in place, and for better or worse, uh, up at Sinai in the internal medicine program, we now implemented a protocol where um, you know residents have a number of options and they've, they've all been made aware of what these options are if they're feeling like they need to they, they know what their resources are um, there's student mental health that they can go to uh, during during the daytime um, during the week <clears throat> but there's also other um, like if they don't want to be connected to the institution there's a group of, of psychiatrists and psychotherapists who volunteer to take residents' insurance and volunteer to see residents that we that we have access to, that we let our residents know about. Um, and then, of course, you know, you need to know that if it really comes, if, it, if you think someone's in, you know, suicidal, there's always the psychiatric ER. And so we've just kind of codified that, put that in a protocol. I'm happy to share that with anyone if that's of interest. Um, but, you, you know, you, you want to have, you want to know what to do when someone like that is, is sitting in front of you. Um, and then, you know, what the sort of last question here, the kind of, proactive component, how do you address, uh, how do you kind of manage this situation, prevent it before it, before it starts, you know, how can you promote a culture of training that uh, prevents res residents from getting to this level of distress, you know, there's a lot, and I didn't get into some of the, the interventions that are now being studied uh, and looked at for, for addressing burnout, uh, both in practicing physicians and in residents, um, but they, they take on these types of, of uh, activities. Uh, there's a lot of buzz around mindfulness right now, um, which does seem, you know, you can be trained to be more mindful, to be in the moment, um, and that that can actually decrease burnout. It really is uh, works best for people that, that want to do this. It's, it's not the kind of thing for some, if you're not interested in it, you can't be forced to do it. Just like facilitated discussions, so discussion groups that are led by faculty with certain expertise and use a, a curriculum. Um, that addresses a lot of these stressful situations as a, as a venue to kind of debrief, either with faculty or just peer-based. Um, those two seem to work. There's some evidence behind that in terms of decreasing burnout. But again, you've got to be interested. You've got
got to be someone who wants to seek that out. Um, there's talk now about sort of resiliency training, how do you train people to kind of uh, grow from the traumatic experiences, develop post-traumatic growth, and then probably the big elephant in the room uh, is the systematic change. You know, how can we talk about um, trying to prevent burnout if we're not talking about all the stressors that the system, uh, that the system puts into place, the systematic um, issues um, you know, that, that are there that are, that are just incredibly burdensome. You know, the, num the numbers of uh, patients that are ready to take care of, um, the number of, of uh, intense ward rotations they have, um, you know, the way uh, we train residents across the country right now is fairly intense. So um, is there, should we be talking about, you know, large systematic change? Um, I think that's, that's a big, uh, you know, it's a big fish to fry, but one to, to think about, um, and certainly you can't talk about all these other things if you're not talking about how the, how the system itself um, leads to burnout. And probably you have to have a combination of these factors because it's not one size fits all. You're going to have some residents that might be interested in mindfulness, others that might want to sit in a discuss discussion group, others that may want to, you know, none of that may, you know, have some, some other uh, activity that helps. So you really need to have kind of a menu of options. And so uh, I'll just summarize by saying that burnout, I hopefully I've expressed to you, I've shown you that it's common. There's a lot of potential factors that lead to it. There's a lot of concerning potential consequences that, there's all these potential uh, multi-pronged interventions that, that use, that empower residents, right, to promote culture change. It's got to be from below and above. Um, all these things might be considered, and I just leave you with, with questions about, you know, hopefully some of which you've been thinking about during the session, <coughs> about how we can train, um, di you know, distressed health providers to seek help without being afraid of appearing weak. Um, to think, hopefully I've got, I've got you thinking about what you would do if someone in your residency program or your training program out, either they express that to you or they just appear that way, um, and do you have a plan in place if, when faced with a resident who needs to be true to stress, um, and, uh, and that's about it. So I'm happy to, um, happy to, to collaborate, I, like, I love to collaborate and share what we're doing, uh, if there's anyone, um, you know, I'm, I'm in, the, in the Sinai email system, Jonathan Brisk, and feel free to reach out. Were there any last questions or comments? concept of resiliency training that you can actually, um, you can, you can deliver, you know, so if you think about, um, uh, if you think about these experiences as traumatic experiences, you can kind of empower, um, you can, you can give, um, trainees skills to deal with them kind of before they, before they come. So for instance, uh, CBT, you know, uh, is similar to the concept of kind of cognitive reappraisal, right? So it's sort of the concept of, you know, turn a lemon into a lemonade, right? So, uh, if you're if you're getting your fourth admission and you just you feel overwhelmed, you know if you're able to kind of step back and re reappraise and reframe the situation and realize that you're going to go home, you know at some point, and um, and that you do have the support you need, and what what can I learn from this experience? Not necessarily learn like what's the exciting medicine here, but you know how do I learn how to be a provider? Um, you can you can teach those skills. So that's kind of when I hear about what you're talking about, which I hadn't heard about before.
thank you very much. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Thanks for making it interactive. And uh, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. someone there or some method of 
giving you feedback so you know what to correct for the next time that you go about it. Um, and then, you know, mastery learning is the idea that you kind of go from milestone to milestone. So as you achieve mastery in one, uh, then with increasing levels of difficulty, you move on to the next goal and the next goal and try to achieve mastery in each of those. Um, and I think uh, Martin Klusik um, and a few of his colleagues um, uh, published this a few years ago. Um, and experience curve is what they called it. And I think it, it helps us to visualize some of these ideas really nicely. On the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is performance. And you know, the idea is that um, you know, if we, if our outcome, let's say, is confidence, um, that we want to achieve some minimum mastery passing standard. And let's say that's confidence for whatever scale it might be that you're looking at. Um, and that really early in training, and we hope that with deliberate practice, our goal and what we expect in most programs is that you have a very steep early learning curve, um, and that the time to, to get to that and achieve confidence is going to depend on what scale you're looking at and what your training is, um, but that we know that different individual learners are going to have different pathways to achieving that, and their time to achieving that outcome is going to differ as well. And I think that this is really important to just put these concepts together because simulation really kind of sits uh, in this training. It, it sort of is the perfect tool to use um, in mastery learning and, and for deliberate practice. And it's really important, I think, to think about it in this context. Um, I think once somebody reaches confidence, you also have to start thinking about decaying of their skills, maintaining their skills, um, or helping them to move on to, to the next step. Um, and this is uh, just a, a little bit of meta-analysis looking at uh, simulation-based medical education with deliberate practice. Um, and you can see here sort of the forest plot that pretty much um, every study that they looked at, there were 14 here that they had their final meta-analysis, um, showed that uh, si simulation-based medical education with deliberate practice had better results than traditional education. Um, and Another study by uh, Cook et al. was also a, a meta-analysis, and they actually looked at mastery learning with simulation um, and compared it to both no training, which is not surprising, that's your top graph, not surprising that compared to no instruction that, that mastery learning would perform better, but also compared to traditional instruction that really overall, um, in pretty much every domain, whether it was knowledge, time, process, location, outcomes, the mastery learning uh, yielded better outcomes in learners. And so to move on from here to sort of talk about, well, okay, what are the methods that we have to do deliberate practice? Um, what exists out there? Um, so I'll talk about a few of these, and like I said, I'm just going to have a sampling of the literature, and I'd love to hear from um, all of you what, what you already might have in practice or some of the things that you're interested in. Um, but uh, going from low fidelity, um, which is role-playing and the use of standardized education, to screen-based computer simulators, parts of task trainers, virtual reality simulators, and then sort of um, high fidelity, which are the mannequins that I think we're all used to thinking about when we think of simulation. Um, so role-playing and standardized patients, I thought this was a, a really interesting study, actually. So um, this was a, a group that wanted to look at longitudinal patient-doctor uh, relationships in, in the sim center. And so what they did was they um, developed three half-day sessions in three consecutive weeks uh, where they had a simulated actor with dementia and a simulated daughter who was the caregiver. Uh, and they basically tried to show progression of the relationship between this doctor, patient, and caregiver over a 10-year period to start, sort of try to simulate a, a longitudinal clinical experience. Um, and you know, they had the learners self um, score themselves, but then they also had the, the simulated patient and the simulated daughter um, score as well in a lot of the skills at both the first and the third session. And, uh, you know, most of these very specific outcomes were communication related and professionalism related. Um, and, you know, in, in the vast majority of them, they showed improvement. Now, in most of the simulation literature, you know, a lot of it is going to be kind of preliminary pilot studies, and often we, we don't know what the patient outcomes are. And we hope that that's where research is going moving forward. But I think that 
some of these kind of very early studies did use tools to teach something that you can't really do in real life. You can't offer a 10-year longitudinal experience to your residents. Um, and so it's a really unique thing. And I think that you know this is just one way of using standardized patients. You can do role playing without standardized actors. Um, but I think that it is really important that whoever plays that part um, has some sort of training uh, so that they know what their role is and what they're supposed to evaluate. That your faculty or your rater, whoever is observing the experience, is also trained. Um, and I, I would I would say that this is probably the largest group of things that you don't have to reinvent the wheel on. When you look at um, MedEd Portal, if um, none of you are familiar with that, it's literally MedEd Portal, and it's a huge com compilation of a lot of curriculums and you know standardized patients and simulations and scenarios with assessment tools that are sort of already out there and peer reviewed. Um, and so you don't always have to you know start this from scratch. If you look at a lot of medical education journals or your specialty specific journals that say publish education um, data, you you might find that in those appendices they also include a lot of that. Um, so I would certainly you know look at all of those sources um, and. You know, this is the most low fidelity, it's the most low cost, it's probably the easiest thing in, in many ways to put together. The next is screen-based computer simulators, and I don't know how many of you have to retain your ACLS training like I do, but if you have in the last few years and you do online training, this is now what's offered uh, for ACLS training, which is literally like a choose-your-own adventure in a simulated sort of computer-based form. Uh, and I, I picked out one sort of uh, article from years ago that I thought was really cool, and I'm not sure if it projects very well, but um, this group, they actually looked at um, gaming, so they had a 3D avatar-based gaming system um, for a sort of this like computerized virtual patient in an OSCE, and um, this was for geriatric training. Um, this was done with internal medicine and family medicine residents, and it was sort of part of a larger geriatric OSCE, but this one station actually had um, this sort of like, I mean, I haven't played any of these but if any of you have, sort of a 3D environment where you walk into um, a, a virtual patient's home and have to do a home safety assessment. And basically there are 3D kind of visuals of every single room with certain obstacles. And as part of the OSCE, they had to mark down, you know, what the different kind of um, safety um, issues were and what they would do to fix it. Uh, and I thought this was really interesting. Now this is something that, you know, you, and, and they showed, um, Actually, what, they, what was interesting, they showed that only a third needed some help with actually the technology of using the 3D virtual sort of simulator, um, and they were able to measure performance. Um, but what's important is, I mean, this is something that I think you need to be very tech savvy, have a gaming partner uh, to really develop something like this. But I think the sort of really easy um, method is if you look online, there's a ton of these that are really simple virtual patient cases that are already out there that are often free of cost. Really easy one is New England Journal of Medicine has interactive cases. Um, simple cases, which is made for medical students on internal medicine clerkships. So there's a ton that's out there that's already open access. You don't always have to create your own. Um, and it's really got a high potential for cognitive skill de development, really I think particular for the younger generation who likes doing things that are kind of tech advanced. Um, so really also a very simple and easy thing to incorporate. Um, partial path trainers, uh, this is huge for me in critical care, huge for you guys who are in EM and um, some of the other procedural specialties. Um, there's a, a ton of data out there, but uh, there's this group, um, Wayne and Barsuk, which are at Northwestern, and they've really pu published a ton on deliberate practice and mastery learning, specifically for procedure-based skills. Uh, and uh, quite a number of their articles are on central venous catheter placement. Um, and so I just picked out one of them uh, just as an example because I think that these are some of the best well done really studies out there. Uh, and here they basically compare traditionally trained residents to, to simulator trained residents for placing central lines. Uh, and we're able to show fewer arterial punctures, fewer needle passes, greater success rates for IJs. Um, so I think these are some of the ones that have really tangible that you can actually measure and see um, and really is easy to institute in, in sort of procedure heavy um, uh, programs. And really there's been a, a quite a bit out 